Uh, it's a privilege to be with you. Uh, I'll bring you greetings from Philadelphia. And uh, the last, last place I preached was the Isle of Skye in Scotland. So uh, bring you greetings from the Isle of Skye in Scotland. A little bit different uh, geography around here. Just as beautiful, though. Our scripture reading today is um, taken from Luke chapter 15. You can read the first several verses and then the um, latter part of the chapter. That's together here, God's Word. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Jesus actually told them three parables. I'm going to skip to the third and final one, beginning at verse 11. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of, of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran to his son. He threw his arms around him and kissed him. The, fa the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So, so he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied. And your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fetid calf for him. My son, the father said, you're always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. This is the word of the Lord. At the end of the sermon, I'm going to ask that we go immediately into the hymn, crown him with many crowns, and that will be, in effect, our prayer of application. Several weeks ago, I read a Facebook post by a, by a minister I admire in which he lamented how, how nasty people can be to one another on social media platforms. And I share that concern. It's for reasons like that that the New York Times 
recently published an article stating that the internet has become a culture of hate. Sometimes, sometimes I just don't want to have anything to do with nasty people like that. And that explains something of the reason why I probably need this sermon more than anyone else. Well, it's the um, third of these stories that will be my primary focus today. We, we, we need to see that third story in context of the first two. And even more important, in the context of verses 1 and 2 of chapter 15. Remember those first two verses. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. You see, it's, it's in response to this grumbling that Jesus tells three parables. He doesn't provide three doctrinal summaries. He doesn't tell three historical stories. He gives them three short stories. Well, why, why all the grumbling there in verses 1 and 2? It, it's not completely different from Peter's reaction in Acts chapter 10 when he was, when he was first invited to eat those wild and weird and unclean animals. Remember that? Acts 10, 14, Peter said, By no means, Lord, I've never eaten anything unclean or, or common. So I think we need to be fair to the, to the scribes and Pharisees. All through the Old Testament, God's people are urged to come out from among the pagans and sinners and be separate. First two chapters of Judges, for example, describes God's anger when Israel mixed with the Canaanites. The Pharisees, in one sense, are just reflecting that reality in their reaction to Jesus. And, and we, we can't forget that Luke affirms that these people with whom Jesus is spending time are sinners. That's, that, that's an inerrant statement, clear indication from the text that these people were notorious and public sinners. And Jesus Jesus seems actually to welcome them. It's a real problem in the culture of the Bible and in the culture of the United States as well. So behind, behind the grumbling of the Pharisees lay many things, some of them anchored solidly in appropriate biblical tradition. I think one of the one of the problems we have in appreciating the power of this text today is that we just don't have the same attitude towards tax collectors as uh, people did in Jesus' day. And, and, and the word sinners is so broad that we find no clear offense there either. But what if? What if the passage were understood to say that Jesus received and ate with men who confirmed multiple occasions when they committed the sexual abuse of women who worked for them? What if the passage were understood to say that Jesus received and ate with practicing homosexuals? This would make it somewhat closer to the impact that it had in Jesus' own day. Why? What, what was Jesus trying to, to, to say? What was he trying to do here in Luke 15? By these, uh, by these various parables, what was Jesus doing? In one sense, he was trying to defend the appropriateness of his actions. But he could have done that quite easily by simply giving a strongly worded theological exposition of such passages as Isaiah 2, which, which describes the coming of the pagan nations 
the mountain of the Lord. In other words, Jesus could have delivered a powerful theological lecture proving that his critics were wrong. Jesus could have done that, but he didn't. Instead, he, he told three stories. And I would suggest that he told these stories, we call them parables, in order to change grumbling to relishing. And if this is true, then it is clear that the stories, the parables, are focused directly on the person with whom the Pharisees and scribes were upset. Jesus himself. Verses 3 through 32, therefore, are primarily about God, specifically about Jesus, the divine Son of God. Luke 15, 3 to 7 is also often called the parable of the lost sheep. I suggest that's the wrong title. It should be called the parable of the seeking shepherd. Key verse is verse 6. And when the shepherd comes home, he calls his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. The point of the parable, this is just the kind of shepherd you would want if you were a lost sheep. Luke 15, 8 through 10 is often called the parable of the lost coin. Wrong. <laughs> Better title would be the parable of the searching woman. And the key verse is verse 9. And when she is founded, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. And Luke 15, 11 to 32 is often called the parable of the prodigal son. By now you know I think that's wrong. The better title would be the parable of the running father. Key verses, verses 20 to 24. And he, the prodigal son, arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, felt compassion, ran and embraced him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven. And before you, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to celebrate. The point, this is just the kind of father you would want if you were a disobedient child. You see, all these stories are about the person who seeks and carries and sweeps and searches and runs and rejoices. The subject of the third parable is the father, not either of the sons. It's crucial crucial to remember that. Now there may be some parallels between the older son and the Pharisees, maybe between uh, parallels between the younger son and the sinners and tax collectors, but the sons are not the focus of the story. There are many problems with trying to interpret the meaning of the sons. The third parable is all about the father. Remember that. It's all about the Father. Why the parable? Not primarily, not primarily to get the Pharisees or us to show more grace toward other people. Though that certainly ought to be done. It's certainly not to suggest that great earthly rewards always follow repentance. Though sometimes that does. No, the primary point of the parable is to turn grumbling to relishing, relishing the Father, because he was and is a Father who runs to repentant sinners with grace and love and forgiveness. It's all about the Father. 
But what, what characteristics can we ascribe to this particular father? Lots of them. He's wealthy. He's a lavish provider. He's patient and loving and forgiving toward both of his sons. Remember this. Neither son treated the father as the father deserved. In the parable, neither son had any justification whatsoever for the way he acted toward his father. Both sons treated their father with selfish disdain. Gimme, gimme, gimme. You have riches now that I want. So give them to me now and give them to me only. No respect, no honor, no devotion to the father himself. <laughs> and and with, with both of these brats, this father is patient, loving, giving, and forgiving. He's not, he's not passively patient either. This father is, is active in his relationship with his son. You see the verbs that are used, running, embracing, kissing, celebrating. Is there anyone here who would not like such a father as this? Anyone here not relish a father like this? And, and the, the, the really neat thing about Luke chapter 15 is that these three parables are themselves examples of fatherly running. The Pharisees grumbled. Jesus Jesus responded patiently with stories designed to help them change grumbling to relishing so that they too would participate in the family celebrations when a brother who was dead is found to be alive, when a son who was lost is found. You see, in the parable of the running father, the heavenly father, in the person of Jesus, is himself running to meet the scribes and Pharisees, just as he had run to meet the sinners and the tax collectors. Why is it? Why is it that we seek to live Christian lives? What is the point of those of our Christian lives? It is always to demonstrate our love for the Father. It is not necessarily to get from the Father blessings. The blessings may come. The primary reason why we obey the commands of Scripture, the reasons we do what Scripture commands us, is because of the honor that that obedience brings to the Father. It's about the Father not about us. There's one um, last complication here, and that is um, actually a glorious complication. The parable of the running father tells part of the story, but there are other chapters in Luke's gospel, and some of those chapters is one which tells about the how, how. Can this father run to welcome sinners home? How can sinful sons and prideful Pharisees alike be brought to turn and return and worship? How much? How much did it really cost this father to take the run that he did? Remember that uh, wonderful passage about this very subject in Isaiah's prophecy. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we have esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs. Surely he has carried our sorrows, yet we did not, we did Strict, esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded 
for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and, and with his stripes we are healed. All we, all we, like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him, on Jesus, the iniquity of us all. You see, that is what it cost the Lord of glory to run and welcome his children home. That is what it cost him to welcome you home. How quickly can, uh, how quickly can this father run? That's probably not a question we often ask, but uh, sometimes we may want an answer. And the Bible provides one. Matthew 27, 44. We're told that early in the crucifixion process, both of the thieves on their own crosses joined the crowds mocking Jesus. Luke chapter 23 takes us later in that, in that horrible day when for reasons that only the Lord himself knows, one thief repented confessing that he deserved the punishment that he was receiving. And then, turning to Jesus, he spoke those marvelous words, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And his Savior, his Savior, immediately in verse 43, speaks words of balm which apply to every aching, sinful, repentant heart. Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. And this leads us right back to where we started, to the reasons why Jesus spoke in parables and why Old Testament prophecies are expressed like Isaiah does. You see, it's, it's simply not enough to know that God is the creator and redeemer. The devil knows this, but he's still the devil. The parable of the running father is intended to lead its readers or hearers to sense, to feel in their gut the worthiness of their heavenly father. It's to lead hearers of the parable to love this father, even even to worship this father. It thus tells an incredibly important truth in a way that is meant to accomplish that truth in the hearts of its hearers. To what end? What did Jesus ultimately want to happen in, in the lives of the scribes and Pharisees? Not just that they would stop grumbling, not just that they would stop criticizing him, he wanted that they might join him in receiving and eating with the sinners to the end that those sinners might return to their father and bring delight to his heart. And remember this, as Jesus looked at those grumblers, he likely saw some of the people who would later demand his death as he sat and listened to those grumbling Pharisees and scribes, he, the omnipotent, omniscient God, probably knew that some of them would demand his death. And to those very people, he ran with gracious, loving words. Because that's who he was. It's all about God. Brothers and sisters in Christ, are you, um, are you ever disappointed in your own ability to keep your promises and commitments to the Lord? I know I am. I want to assure you that your God, because Jesus bore your <laughs> sin and guilt, your God is ready to run and welcome you home? Are you often discouraged by the 
drift of our Western culture. I know I am. I want to assure you that your God, because of the work of his son, is running to lavish love upon all of those who turn toward home. Are you concerned about the spiritual welfare of a, of a child or a parent or a sibling or a friend? I know that I, know that I am. But I want to assure you that because Jesus perfectly kept the law of the Lord, your God is running. Even now, even this morning, he is running to bring a day when there will be no more tears, no pain, no mourning, no death. A day when, to reverse the language of Narnia, it's always Christmas, but never winter. And though I do not know how in the world the Lord is going to do all of this, I do know that when he does, all the earth will be astounded by his majesty and glory and by his grace and will sing his praises forever. And I would suggest that now might be a good time to start with crown him with many crowns.